In my hand, I have a piece of technology. A piece of technology that can solve world peace, can be the end of hunger worldwide, the end of poverty. This piece of technology is so incredible that even can help to stop climate change. What do you think this piece of technology is? My name is uh, Louis Dieger, and when I was 18 years old, I didn't really know what to do with my life, I think like a lot of you. Um, so I started to go traveling. I went on a one-year road trip across the United States, Central America, Morocco, and I was looking for a, a meaning in life to see what should I do, what can I contribute uh, to this planet. And I was really um, flabbergasted when I saw uh, really one hundred thousands of hectares in the United States of America with only corn, monocultures, only soy, monocultures, nothing else, and it was destroying the Mississippi Delta. It was destroying the Gulf of Mexico, turning it into a dead zone because of all the pesticides. When I went further south in uh, Mexico, further down in, in, in Central America, I saw the effects it had, this destructive nature, uh, this destructive agriculture, on uh, the communities itself. People were living in poverty, and children, they had to go to bed without food in their stomachs. It really uh, made me very sad. Imagine if it were your child. Um, and the real tipping point came to me when I was uh, back um, in, in, in Morocco. Um, I saw the desert, and I'm somebody who can uh, forage in the wild. I know a lot of edible plants, so I always no, I can survive, but there I felt really uneasy because there was nothing to eat. And um, there was a guide said in his best French, Louis, this used to be a Garden of Eden, but we made it into a desert. Um, this was the breadbasket of Europe. Uh, the same with Tigris and Euphrates. A lot of these Mediterranean regions that are now deserts, they used to be uh, agricultural places. So this is the end stage of conventional agriculture. If we are keep doing it this way, it will end up like this desert. When I went further, further up in Spain, I don't know who of you has been to Spain lately, um, there are giant amounts of earth that are becoming a desert as well. Really scary. The same in, 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 uh, in uh, the south of France. Um, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean region is becoming a desert. Even in Belgium, I saw cracks in the soil that I thought only existed in Africa. Um, the desert is coming to us. Uh, so I decided to become a farmer. That was what my conclusion was after seeing all this, to be a farmer and do it differently. So I, uh, I started to study agro and biotechnology, um, learn a lot about farming, and I also had to do an internship. On this internship, one of the toughest things I had to do was harvest leeks at a freezing temperature. I can still feel the shivering in my body. Maybe you're feeling it right now, it's a bit cold here. Um, I had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to reflect on farming, learn about it, and I learned a lot of scary things about the current way we are farming. The first thing uh, that was scary was money, or better, the lack of money. I wanted to become a farmer, so I needed to buy land. If I want to buy 10 hectares of land, I had to pay 1 million euros. So I went to the bank and did some calculations. I had to work for more than 200 years selling grains to pay back this 1 million euros, and even then I wouldn't be able to pay it back. So that was like the first red alert, but I was stubborn, I kept going. Uh, then I heard the next story of uh, the farmers, the well-being of the farmer is really bad. Every day there's a farmer that commits suicide. First I learned about the statistics, but then I learned... Uh, I, I met people who, whose family members committed suicide because there's such a big pressure on the farmer's shoulders um, that they just escaped uh, reality. And that really gave me a, a rock in my stomach. Then you might think, okay, but then farming must be good for the planet. Uh, but no, uh, the United Nations predicts that in 2050, 90%, 90% of all the agricultural land will be destroyed. So in 30 years, there won't be 
a lot of good food left if we continue this way, then you might think, okay, maybe it's then good for the consumer. But even then, you have to eat more apples today to have the same nutrition as 50 years ago. The nutritional value of food has gone down drastically the last 70 years. And then you might think, okay, maybe it's good for human health. But even then, if you have a baby in your womb, it is already exposed to pesticides before it is even born. The first welcome drink this baby gets, mother's breast milk, is already full of pesticides, which makes it that every child in Belgium has pesticides in their blood. Every child. So, as you can hear, there are only losing parties in agriculture. Well, after hearing all this, I didn't really want to become a farmer anymore. So I decided to uh, start a landscape architecture business uh, to do something with land, um, but in another way to regenerate as many land as possible uh, and also to inspire as many people as possible to do something about it so future 18 years old will be able to become a farmer. Now, you, mi you might ask yourself, but how is it possible we ever got here in this uh, type of farming situation? And you might also ask yourself, well, are all farmers evil creatures destroying our planet? Uh, not at all. They are also victims of society. We want cheap clothes, we want cheap travel, and we want cheap food. But the most logical reason why we ever came to this uh, is the end of World War II, people were hungry. Uh, and they said, we want never hunger again. So they had a new policy to make farming as efficient as possible, as productive as possible. And um, they uh, went bigger, um, more machines and more chemicals. It, of course, also helped that there were very clever entrepreneurs who had huge amounts of munition they couldn't sell anymore. So they thought, what should we do with it? Oh, let's make fertilizers out of it, and let's use them to kill bugs instead of humans. And that's exactly what happened. So the farmers did not have any choice. They had to get big or get out. Um, today we have almost no farmers left. The farmers' population is going down drastically. At the same time, when I was harvesting these leeks, and uh, was freezing to death, I was back at home, near the fireplace, reading a book, and in this book I saw this wonderful story about a chestnut tree, a chestnut tree on the Mount Etna volcano, which is still living today, and this tree is 4,000 years old. Imagine, 4,000 years old, and every year, year after year, it is still producing chestnuts. So I was thinking, me, as a future farmer, I had to plant leeks every year, again, again, year after year. I had to work the soil, plant it again, harvest it, work the soil, until the end of days. But I could just plant this chestnut tree, sit under it for the next 4,000 years, and let the food fall into my lap. I just had to sit next to this tree, and much more time sitting by the fireplace, reading books. And so I asked myself, yeah, why don't we work together more with trees in agriculture? Because did you know that trees are actually the grown-ups in nature? Who in this room ever had a baby? Okay, so you know how it is. A baby, you have to take care of it 24-7, right? You have to be there all the time. It's a lot of work. Who here has a grown-up in his or her life? A spouse, maybe? Well. Normally, you have less work, if you're lucky. <laughs> um, it's the same in nature. You have baby nature, which are annuals, eh, the very small, uh, the small plants which you have to take care of, such as corn, um, uh, corn or mice, uh, cereals, uh, other crops. And you have the grown-ups, the trees, a forest. You don't have to water it, you don't have to fertilize it, you don't have to... Um, uh, give pesticides, and they give the most biggest uh, creatures you've ever seen. And you all know it. 
You probably have watched the Netflix documentaries of Chernobyl or washed your car on the driveway, or you might sneak into factory buildings to take pictures. You've seen it happen. It is called succession. If you do nothing, there will be tiny mosses growing on the pavement. A little later, there will be tiny plants. A little later, bushes, shrubs, and before you know it, you have trees in the middle of the street, you have a forest in the middle of the city. Just like what happened here in Chernobyl. Uh, this is called succession. So you might ask yourself, why not base our agricultural system on trees? Because forests, they are perfect. You might think, wow, this is a very innovative idea. But as a matter of fact, uh, this idea is more than 12,000 years old. This spring, we've, we went to uh, Brazil, to the rainforest, to the Amazon rainforest, and we learned from Benki Pianco, um, the, the, the leader of the Yorenka Tassarensi Institute, that they've been doing this for more than 12,000 years. These communities helped to shape the Amazon. The Amazon is actually a 12,000 years old food forest and agricultural system. So we humans have now uh, done some work throwing indigenous people out of this forest because, hey, leave the forest alone. Hey, it's perfect, it's nature, you, you, you cannot interfere with it. But what they don't know is these indigenous people help to make this Amazon. So this changes our paradigm totally because today we're fighting against nature, but there we see that we're actually part of nature, that nature can go far, humans can go far, but if we work together, we can go much further. Okay, then you might ask, yeah, but it's impossible to fill uh, the supermarkets with food from uh, the rainforest, for example. And this is exactly what Pedro Diniz from Brazil thought. He was uh, a Formula One pilot um, who drastically changed his life after his uh, car caught fire and he almost died. And he said, well, I'm going to build this rainforest on this barren piece of land, but I'm going to put everything neatly in rows so I can harvest all the produce with machinery. So I can really make it very efficient and I can fill supermarkets with the produce of it. So he did this and now has a farm uh, with every one euro you put into it, you get one euro 25 cents out of it. Financially, it's, say, uh, it's very... Um, good, his company, but also nature, there is more biodiversity in his farm than there is in the natural forest nearby, and there are more trees per hectare than in the natural forest nearby. So it's a win-win situation. And then you might ask, yeah, but that's very good and well in the tropics. Does it also work in Europe? Europe, for example, or in the United States, more temperate regions? Yes, it does. For example, in Spain, um, where we went filming um, a couple of uh, months ago for uh, our documentary, Eat More Trees, which we're uh, hoping to get on your favorite uh, streaming platform very soon. And there we met this wonderful couple called Annick and Alfonso. Yannick and Alfonso, sorry. And uh, they inherited a farm from their parents, uh, a monoculture farm with mostly cereals. Um, but they decided to do it differently. They decided to uh, plant more regeneratively and also plant trees. Now, disaster struck last year. They had one year without a single drop of rain. And then suddenly, they got all this rain in three days. So imagine, there were literally, it was pouring down, it washed away all the cereals, washed away all the topsoil, and the entire region was really struck by it because they had no harvest. The only thing that did survive was their trees. And here you saw trees without any soil cover, still a lot of erosion. But how they are doing it is they are planting these trees on the contour lines. They're planting flowering meadows beneath them so animals can graze. And they have aromatic plants they can also sell. So they're basically doing vertical farming, farming in different dimensions, and it's also good because they spread their ways to get an income. They bet on different systems. Then you might ask, yeah, but do we need to eat trees from now on? 
Well, good idea, you should, but you don't have to. There are also other possibilities. For example, in Kansas, there's the Land Institute, who is making from these leeks, which you have to replant every year, um, they are making leeks, for example. You only have to plant once and you can keep harvesting. They're making grains, these cereals you can see, um, which you only have to plant once and you can harvest it year after year, again and again, so you don't have to disturb the soil. So, which plant are we going to bet on for the next drought or the next rainstorm? The one on the left uh, or the one on the right? The one with the huge roots. We need plants that live more than one year so they can establish themselves and be more resistant. This is the way of the future. I'd like you to imagine yourself this beautiful, wonderful future with lots of new foods coming our way that can replace or complement annual foods, perennial foods. For example, this acai ice cream, which I discovered in Brazil, really lovely, um, but also American chip cookies, American chocolate chip cookies made with acorn flour, for example, or walnut oil, which I'm addicted to. Or why not chestnut bread or one of these grains that is made into beer or whiskey? So there are so many great things coming our way. I might have yeah, there's possibly that you're thinking, but how are we going to convince everybody to eat more trees, to eat more perennials, to eat more plants that live more than one year? How are we going to change it? Who in this room is a vegetarian? Okay, you might have uh, tried to convince other people to become a vegetarian. Anybody who succeeded in convincing anybody? Two people? Three? Oh, two, a couple of them. Nice, good work. <laughs> but it's almost impossible to do. So how are we going to do it? Well, we might start by calling Jamie Oliver or uh, uh, Otto Lenghi or why not Gordon Ramsay uh, to ask them to uh, inspire people on television, uh, show people uh, how to cook acorn dishes, for example. But we all know it's very, very difficult to change people, their habits, so we might have to sneak tree-based food into people's diets. Who of you like to eat pizza, cookies, pastas, bread? Okay, a lot of you. Imagine if I would replace 1% of the cereal flour, the normal flour, with chestnut flour, only 1%. Do you think you would taste it? Probably not. But you would see it in the landscape because that would be 1% of agriculture, more trees. You might think, hmm, that's maybe a little bit far-fetched, uh, but they've done it with biodiesel. So why couldn't we do it with food? You think it would be possible to do it with food? Who think it's possible? Okay, nice. If you're not convinced, they already did this. So they, uh, if you go to the United States of America, every product you buy almost has corn inside of it. Corn starch, corn flour, corn syrup, because they over-subsidized corn and now it's in every product. So if they can do it with corn, they can do it with trees. Now I have this piece of technology in my hand, and this will change the world. This is a chestnut. If we plant this chestnut into the ground, we'll have food for the next 4,000 years. Potentially, I'll already be happy with 50 years or 100 years. But imagine if we plant billions of them everywhere, on agricultural land, on uh, abandoned plots of land, on schoolyards, uh, in cities, then we will have a revolution. And I would like you to invite all of you to the Eat More Trees revolution. And I would like you to follow Eat More Trees, to watch the Eat More Trees documentary, but most and for all, to eat more trees. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Louis. All right. I have one more question, Louis, before you go. The region where we're living in, Flanders, I read that up to 7, maybe 8% of our Flanders surface is made up of 
private backyards. Exactly, almost 10%. Yeah. 10, even 10. Whoa. It's more than there are natural areas yeah. in Flanders. So that's amazing. That's yeah. crazy. But isn't there an alliance or let's say a coalition of the willing of people who want to encourage individuals or policymakers to transfer it in something else? Is there some group you, you are aware of or initiative? Well, we are doing this with Food Forest Institute Food and there Forest are Institute. a lot of different uh, organizations doing it. We have Welt doing it, Natuurpunt is inspiring people um, because you have the power in your own backyard if we all tr only transform one square meter into something more natural, we'll have created the biggest natural reserve of Belgium. Only one square meter per person. Uh, you can plant a chestnut tree, for example, then you have food and nature. It's a perfect marriage of the two. And that's why, in my opinion, uh, the food tree deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, because it brings nature and agriculture together. It's a perfect marriage of the two. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. <laughs> Give him a warm applause. <laughs> okay.